Welcome to a casual Monday edition. You're saying, Kevin, it's not Monday. That's how casual this edition is of Anglican Unscripted, episode 503. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 14th of May, 2019, and it's it's the Feast of St. Matthias. And that's interesting because the appointment of St. Matthias followed a terrible apostolic betrayal. Uh, Judas was replaced by Matthias, and that may have some bearing on what we discussed today. Okay, Gavin, welcome to the program. George is on a well-deserved vacation with his wife this week, and so we're not going to bother him. We're not going to have him log on from the poolside and give us updates on news in the Anglican Church. He's just going to have a nice, restful time, and please pray for him as he rests, because it's not his default position to take vacation. I think this is one of the few ones he's taken in the last 10, 20 years. Mrs. Conger has earned it. Uh, being the wife of of uh, George. So uh, please keep in your prayers. Your responsibility as a viewer and listener to Anglican Unscripted is to share, comment, uh, like the program if you find it on Facebook or you find it on YouTube, and uh, just be part of uh, our audience. We, we had like 85 comments on one of these episodes. We really appreciate it. It's It's fun to see the conversation. It's fun to be part of the conversation. Gavin, you're not in your palace in France. <laughs> you're certainly not in your cathedral outside your house. Where are you now? No, no, I, I am in France. I'm in Normandy. <laughs> you're all you're in Normandy. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any palaces. <laughs> uh, although wherever wherever Jesus is king, there is a palace. That's so good, the palace good. of my heart, perhaps. <laughs> That's great. Well, normally people don't get to see the inside of your place in Normandy. That we normally record at a little bar outside of a Normandy. That's that's fun to do. So um, let's get on to some. Speed, yes. Yeah, let's get on to some of the news. Um, I would like to be sitting down with you and announcing Brexit finally occurred, and uh, that does not seem to be in the cards yet. Um, and I wanted to talk about that real quick. What is the latest of the latest update? I hear they've now pushed it off. We're in a period of suspension. Mm -hmm. The interesting political developments now are that the European elections that they promised would never happen because Brexit would have taken place right. are now about to happen. And uh, depending on how long Brexit takes, the people who are elected may only be in the assembly for months or, or years. But the really interesting phenomenon is there is a new political party called the Brexit Party. Mm -hmm. uh, it's led by Nigel Farage, who's not the most attractive of, of, of politicians or people, but he's pretty stubborn. And um, the really interesting thing is he's sweeping the country and a huge amount of support appears to be developing. So that will embarrass the government when the Brexit Party wins so many seats in the European Parliament. But of course, what, we, what they're really preparing for is a general election. And the Brexit, the new Brexit party will then stand uh, in, the, uh, in the general election whenever that happens. And that could be the beginning of a sea change in British politics. Yeah, it's from here in America, it's really interesting to watch because it seems like you guys are under occupation. You know, you, you put forward, you were asked, what's your opinion? You went to the polls, you gave <laughs> the leaders your opinion, and they said, thank you for your opinion, and just went about their business. You know, yes, and democracy is not working. <laughs> you guys are having a little trouble communicating with the leadership what your real opinion really was. And uh, it's, it's fun to watch it play out, because we're having the same struggles here in America. It's not like uh, we're innocent in all this as well. Um, it, it's no longer a government of the people for the people. Yeah. Well, let's... I, I don't think people realize quite how delicate democracy is. Mm -hmm. um, for people uh, our age, over, over 50, um, some of us over 60, uh, we have some kind of memory of the assaults on democracy in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We preserve democracy by the skin of our teeth, right? the courage of a few notable historical figures, as well as the determination of peoples. But that courage and that determination are much shorter supply today. And the anxiety is that people don't 
understand how how precious political and democratic freedom is and the price they may have to pay for it. Well, we've seen other countries try democracy and quickly fall. Um, mm -hmm. And the will of the people when trying to obtain freedom, uh, sometimes they, they trade too much and uh, some bad people get in government and all of a sudden they have no freedom at all. And that's just a big history lesson for us all. I'm afraid that was a news flash. <laughs> <A> news flash. <laughs> probably didn't. Well, good. Probably didn't say anything very interesting. No, so. no, that's a, that's the Anglican unscripted news flash. Let's talk about Anglican news. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Let's talk about Anglican news. Um, now, the latest news, and it, I, it's starting to happen now. You see, I have to turn all my things on silent too. Every year, something happens in a cathedral, and it's very disappointing to Anglicans to watch this happen. And at the start of Ramadan, the St. Paul's Cathedral decided they would do something unique, reach out to our uh, uh, Muslim neighbors uh, and show them the love we have within the church. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't think you're doing it right. Why don't we talk a little bit about this? Well, I have to apologize to our listeners, first of all, because I find it very hard to take the, the Bishop of London seriously. She To me, she looks like a midwife. Mm -hmm. she, she was a, a senior midwife. Well, that, this is the wind blowing heavily. <laughs> okay. um, she was a senior midwife, and, and uh, to me, she still looks like a senior midwife, even in a purple cassock. But the, there's a distressing picture of her um, surrounded by a lot of happy people, but including the Muslim mayor of London. And they had invited people into St. Paul's Cathedral for an interfaith service and a, at a great supper to mark the end of Ramadan afterwards. And of course, at first sight, this looks like an act of civilization and generosity and good neighborliness. How can anyone be unpleasant enough to complain? I think it's based upon the fact that people misunderstand Christianity and they misunderstand Islam. No, I, I agree. It does sound like a little windstorm going on there. Uh, a lot of, you know, Muhammad wrote about Mary, wrote about Abraham, wrote about Noah. Um, but when I read that, it's kind of his own fantasy Noah. It's his own fantasy Abraham and his own fantasy Mary. They're not the ones that we know from our Old and New Testaments. R religious education teachers for the last 60 years have been following a particular idea which is that Islam is one of the Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. and therefore Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are, are cousins, if you like. Um, th this is simply not true, <laughs> because they're confused by the fact that in the Quran you find some figures in the Old Testament replicated. So as you quite rightly say, Abraham is there, Moses is there, Noah is there, uh, Miriam, Mary is there, mm -hmm. even Jesus is there. But these are not the real figures from our Bible. These are, as you quite rightly say, characters that Mohammed borrowed to give some kind of pedigree to his religious visions. And the problem is he's borrowed them badly. They don't, um, they don't represent, they don't uh, act as the real people from the real Bible. So one has to, to ask the question, is it just that Mohammed has a slightly distorted view of these people, or, or is it a, an entirely fictitious alternative which will end up with a completely alternative view of God? So the, the Allah in the Quran is not Adonai or Yahweh in the Bible. Uh, he has an entirely different relationship with Adam than uh, we have in Genesis. In fact, it's absolutely impossible to have a personal relationship with Allah. This is, this is not the God and Father of mankind who reveals himself through the law and the prophets and then comes in person and makes himself vulnerable to, to us. This is a dictator, an unknowable dictator who requires submission. Now, that in itself would be problematic if it wasn't for the fact that Muhammad also says Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Uh, and when Jesus says, I will rise from the dead, and I did rise from the dead, Jesus is telling an untruth. Well, this puts Islam into a very different kind of category of religion than a, an Abrahamic cousinly faith. It makes it um, an opponent, uh, an enemy of Christ, 
And what we find, particularly in the Muslim majority countries, is that's how it behaves. If, for example, we'd seen in Saudi Arabia Muslims inviting Christian communities in to share their iftar, end of Ramadan meals, in, inviting to bring their symbolism and their Bibles in a kind of Abrahamic cousinly love fest, then the teaching philosophy of these people who have educated Western school children might be vindicated. But of course, we see the exact opposite. In, in, in North England, one of the things that's recently emerged is uh, a, a woman vicar has off invited the local Muslim community into her church and she's covered the crosses so they're not offended when they come in to use um, two of the rooms to pray and, uh, and to share an iftar supper. So Jesus made it very clear that if you're going to be a disciple of his, you don't betray him. You, you say um, you're, not, you're not ashamed of who he is and what he does. I can't think of any act that is more like Judas, who was replaced by Matthias, whose feast day it is today, than covering up the cross as if somehow you're ashamed of it or you want to disassociate yourself from it. Any Christian community that wants to disassociate itself from the cross, disassociate itself from Jesus. I, I have to agree there. Um, if the cross, if the scriptures, if the, the prayers we give are embarrassing to you, you probably have a problem. And uh, it's, it's going to hurt you, but it's also going to hurt your witness, and it's going to hurt the church ultimately. And we've seen this through history. Whenever we compromise in our faith, we don't just wipe out our own heart. We wipe out... Uh, almost a generation of other Christians by, by our weaknesses. And, we're well, seeing and there's a real danger that people may go to hell. Um, you know, Jesus spoke very clearly about hell. In fact, we know more about hell through the words of Jesus than through any other source. And one of the things he said very clearly was, anyone who's ashamed of me and my gospel, on the last day I'll be ashamed of them. What are these Anglican clergy going to do when they face Jesus on the last day and say, well, I covered you up because I didn't want to offend other people by your words, your life, your truth, your good news, your sacrifice. I, I, I'm afraid I think they put themselves in a very serious position. And I just guess it can't, it, they haven't read the books or they don't understand them. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, Christians reaching out and inviting uh, other faiths into the cathedrals and into the churches to share in the other face, uh, religious practices and stuff like that. I don't see uh, Muslim mosques and others reaching out to Christians and offering us pr uh, Christian prayers within their uh, um, mosque. Have Nor do they this? reach out to Jews. In fact, uh, uh, English politics is being seriously marred by a horrible anti-Semitism. Now, nobody says so in the newspapers. But the reason for this anti-Semitism, this hatred of Jews and hatred of Israel, which people used to pretend was a difference between Judaism and Zionism, but they've dropped that pretense now, is because the Labour Party are trying to gain the bloc Muslim vote. And the best way they do that is by being horrible, not only to Zionism, not only to Israel, but to all Jews. And so you have a resurgence of Nazi-like anti-Semitism in Europe in order to buy Islamic votes into our democracy. Well, Muslim countries are not very good on democracy. When they get power, that's not their first priority. So it is extraordinarily short-sighted of the secular English politicians on the left to try and make this allegiance. Well, I think by rule in, in the Quran, if they have 51% of the vote, they have to impose Sharia law. And, they you know, certainly want to impose your law. <laughs> All the to, 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 to the surprise of liberal-minded people, whenever Muslims throughout the world are asked uh, what proportion of them endorse acts of terrorism and violence, and what proportion of them want Sharia law where they live, the percentages are remarkably high. Here in America, we have a uh, government representative. Her name is Rashida Tlaib. And she said, whenever she thinks of the Holocaust, she th is calmed. It's a calming thought for her. And uh, she's, 
Yeah, dear, dear God is right. Shia is of the Islamic faith. She's a new representative in, in our Congress this year. Uh, she's from, I think, Minnesota. Not exactly sure that, maybe South Dakota. Um, and it's amazing to watch the anti-Semitism not just kind of take hold, take a solid hold here in America as well. And the liberals are afraid to condemn her because she represents votes. She represents support. She represents a way to get you know their mediocre and very socialist ideas across uh, Congress and into the legislation of you know leadership in America. And it's scary to watch how something that was impossible twenty years ago, unlikely ten years ago, be very scary this year. And mm. I'm sure you see the same over in Europe. History is speeding up in an extraordinary way. And one can complain that teachers haven't been teaching history properly, and that's partly true. Mm. And one can complain that, that people's attention spans are, are much diminished and they uh, they get news the kind you know, the kind of news they want where and how they want it. But the idea that within a generation, the horror of Auschwitz, and I think I think probably to the theological implications of Auschwitz, um, one of the things that propelled me into Christ's arms was a reflection on how Auschwitz came about. I, 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 my own sort of internal anthropology, my understanding of how human beings worked, didn't fit in with, the, with Auschwitz. How, how could our German cousins calmly gas and burn babies and children and or, or women and helpless old men and women what overcame them to do that and one of the things i fairly quickly realized was that you have to have a very developed sense of evil a, a kind of evil that can get into the human heart and poison it and twist it quickly and badly and one of the reasons why one would want to be a Christian is because it offers a defense against evil. It unmasks evil. It gives us the power of Christ's blood against evil. Uh, it, it allows the human heart to be cleansed of evil by penitence and faith. Now, without those, the human heart is very vulnerable to the presence of evil. And certainly I look at history and wherever I see anti-Semitism, a rage against God's covenant people. Uh, there you see the fingerprints of Satan. And of course, one of the places where you see the fingerprints of Satan is in the church. The church from time to time has succumbed to this evil, which to my mind only it acts as a reminder that one has to set one's level of spiritual safety very high indeed. Right. An interesting uh, contrast is to look at the, the seminaries in Germany right after the uh, First World War and how they started to really compromise and become liberal. And so they put out liberal students, and there was a large portion of liberal clergy in the time of World War II when Hitler came to rise, and they were just not there. Some did. There were the Bonhoeffers, but they just were not there to say, stop. They were not there to say, well, this Bonhoeffer. is... You know, there were, but there were a couple Bonhoeffers. Well, Bonhoeffer is a hugely important figure for many of us today because there are so many parallels in England at any rate, between yeah. our civilization at the moment and Germany in the early 1930s. Uh, we, we sense a growing totalitarianism creeping up down the road in front of us. And the, the terrible tragedy, and the, one of the reasons why I am outspoken against Justin Welby and the House of Bishops is they appear to me to be behaving in a, a way that compromises the faith that is terrifyingly similar to the way in which what we call Reichskirche, the state church in Germany, did so in the face of Nazism. Now, when Hitler and Nazism appeared, they offered some very attractive uh, political programs to the German people, uh, a certain solace for their pride after economic devastation of the Great Crash, uh, the, the inflationary period in Germany, and the uh, defeat the of the First World War. The Treaty of Versailles. But as, I mean, as so often it was a... Sorry, Kevin. I was going to say that was caused by the Treaty of Versailles, you know. Yes, it was called, it was called by Versailles. Mm -hmm. But it took Bonhoeffer and a small group of faithful clergy, and I have to say also um, a significant number of Roman Catholics, uh, a portion of Roman Catholics and a, a group of Lutherans led by Bonhoeffer were the only people to say, we see the Christian gospel compromise and being twisted out of shape, and the state church must repent. And we're saying the same thing today. We see the Christian gospel 
being twisted out of shape, and the state church must repent. I'm very much hoping that they don't do to some of us what they did to Bonhoeffer. Well, that's another topic I want to talk about. Largely, Anglican Unscripted has gone under the radar of some of the more virulent responders in England. Um, you and I have friends who are bloggers and newspaper writers who um, are com just at atrociously attacked by um, the enemies of the church uh, in England. Uh, I think of Caroline Farrow. I think of uh, others mm. that are being protected by a Christian concern. And so far, we've been okay. What, what do you think the future will hold? It's very grim. Yeah. Poor Caroline Farrow. Uh, I've appeared on BBC TV with her. She's a very reputable, courageous, gutsy woman. She spoke out against transgenderism mm -hmm. and has been on the receiving end of the most appalling public campaign. Pizzas get delivered to her door every hour of the night. Um, the, the level of horrible, unkind persecution uh, is, is unremitting for her. Well, they've been stalking her family. They've been stalking her. Uh, an online campaign. They call the police and complain. The police show up on their her doorstep and have to interview <laughs> yeah. her for five hours. You know, and she's like, "I didn't do any of that." You know, and it's a, it, they, they it, accuse it's her of a hate crime for objecting to being persecuted by transgender activists. Um, <laughs> so the, we, the truth is being turned upside down. My, one of the things I wrote about in the last couple of weeks was Roger Scruton, who's just the most delightful, um, I would say, semi-Christian intellectual. I mm -hmm. think Scruton's Christianity is of an aesthetic and an intellectual kind rather than a full-blown throat in the arms of Jesus. There's perhaps there's time for that. Um, but he's one of the few philosophers of the center. I, I'll say center because I think that's he's easy, not yeah. really on the right. Mm -hmm. um, they, they People describe him as being on the far right. <laughs> and this this mistakes the fact that he he uh, he's he's a great critic of Marxist revolutionaries because mm -hmm. he's exposed the terrible evil that they've done. And so the left has hated him. And he's in his early seventies. He can't get a proper job as a academic philosopher because of the way in which the universities have moved out to the hard left. But uh, recently, he was interviewed by the deputy editor of the New Statesman, which is a left-wing journal. And uh, he talked in a fairly friendly and low-key way about various things. And then all hell broke loose because a number of his sentences were taken out of context and changed and put onto Twitter. And so in the early morning, uh, the, the journalist said, that Scruton was a homophobe, he was a racist, and of all things, an anti-Semite, because he had criticized George Soros. And by lunchtime, a horde of MPs had said, this terrible man must have no part in the, in the government. He had one small, tiny role on a, on a committee that scratched his head and wrote complicated things about building programs and aesthetics. Not, 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 I'm completely unpaid. And by tea time, the government, conservative government minister, without phoning him, talking to anybody, had sacked him. Now, that was bad. The thing that's much worse was that um, the George Eaton, the journalist, refused to release the tape of what Scruton had actually said. I'm so surprised. Scruton couldn't defend himself. Right. And uh, wonderfully, somebody in the New Statesman building hacked into George Eaton's email account and sent a recording to Scruton. So Scruton released it. He gave it to a man called Douglas Murray, who's uh, an authority on Islam. And they said, this is what Scruton said. He's not remotely homophobic. Uh, he's not remotely racist. He, had, uh, he was accused of, of um, saying rude things about the Chinese people. But what he was really talking about was the way in which Chinese Marxist government turned out robotic humans who were forced to believe uh, an unremitting diet of Marxist propaganda. Mm -hmm. This is not racist against Chinese. This is critical of, of communist government. And his comments about George Soros were simply low-key and factually true. Now, you'd think at this point, 
the government would say, gosh, we're really sorry. We acted too quickly. We shouldn't read Twitter. <laughs> and welcome back to your, to your chairmanship of this not very important committee. But instead, they did absolutely nothing. So we're faced with the fact that a public libel, a public disinformation campaign against somebody can be proved to be malicious and libelous and untrue, and nobody cares. Nobody does anything about it. In other words, there is not enough regard for the truth in our political or social culture to resist lies. Well, if that's where we really are, we're in very, very deep trouble because what it means is people can say anything they like about us. We can prove it's not true, and still we end up condemned in the public space. So, and I think this has got a lot to do with the way in which people have become sub-Christian. They misunderstand how Christianity has stood by the truth as part of its gift to culture, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and by doing that, it's replacing fidelity to the truth to a kind of political, slimy pragmatism, which is how left-wing authoritarianism has flourished in the past. We're two decades out from a major event here in America I want to refer to, but Christianity has lost the benefit of the doubt. I use that phrase a lot. Um, back in the the, uh, the reign of George Bush, his first uh, um, time as president, uh, this is the second one, George W., a, we had a, uh, a news anchor. His name was Dan Rather. And one day he and his producers uh, were able to produce a fake report on some Air Force or um, fighter pilot stuff that um, George W. had done. It was all made up, and oh, he's avoiding the National Guard. I forget the whole story, but it was a made-up story. It was published, and at the time, Dan Rather lost his job for creating a fake story, and his producer got fired for the, creating the fake story. Um, they were held accountable. You're not allowed to do that. Even if you're a nationally recognized figure in America, if you're not honest and you can't hold up to the scrutiny, you're going to lose your job. Now we have the opposite. Did this reporter who uh, lied about the interview lose their job? No, he did go to the extent of apologizing for not managing social media as well as he should have done. <laughs> that was as far as he went. <laughs> and that, that was, as far as I can see, almost the only consequence. The problem is a good number of people um, said, well, we will never vote for this government again. Mm -hmm. um, so the new the, the elections that are coming are really going to be quite interesting because, I mean, I would I would be one of them. I would be somebody who could never vote for the Conservatives after treating Roger Scruton like that. Mm -hmm. For a number of other reasons, I might not want to vote as well. But for me, it, it, that would be such a deal breaker. How could you trust such people? Um, so when it comes to the parties that claim our vote in the next election, uh, there might very well be a real meltdown of old allegiances all, all round. It won't just be me. It won't just be the Conservatives. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Just, this could either be a very refreshing uh, period of political renewal, or it could be a disastrous collapse of the House of Cards. <sighs> well, you know what it is? It's called job security for you and me. We will always have something to talk about when we sit down and do Anglican Unscripted. It doesn't always have to be Anglican, but it certainly has to be in the news. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 503 on St. Matthias Day. <laughs>